Hello, I'm Leonard Maltin, and you're about to see a slice of movie history that can also qualify as a milestone in popular culture, the debut of Mickey Mouse. In our media-saturated universe, with thousands of cartoons available on television 24 hours a day, it might be difficult to appreciate the impact that Mickey Mouse had on the movie-going public back in 1928. But let's try to step back in time and understand why it was so special. Cartoons have been a regular part of the movie program since the teens. While audiences enjoyed them, they didn't give them much thought. Many popular newspaper comic strips were transferred to the screen, but only a couple of original animated characters achieved real fame. Max Fleischer's Coco the Clown and Pat Sullivan's Felix the Cat. Otherwise, most people, even in the film industry, tended to think of cartoons as interchangeable. That's one reason that Walt Disney had such a hard time in the 1920s. His 1927 creation, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, didn't stand out from the crowd. And when the character was taken from him and given to another animation studio, I doubt that anyone noticed. Walt produced the first two Mickey Mouse cartoons on his own, on speculation, without a commitment from any distributor. Then he took the biggest chance of all trying out a new sound on film technique. Steamboat Willie was built on the foundation of sound and music. And when Walt convinced a New York City theater owner to give it a try, the response was simply phenomenal. Why? Because in 1928, only a handful of live-action talking pictures had been released. So the idea of sound itself was still brand new. The notion that cartoon characters could move to the rhythms of music in perfect syncopation and that funny sounds could emanate from the screen was an absolute sensation. I've often felt that Mickey Mouse, like Walt, was in the right place at the right time. If another character had starred in Steamboat Willie, we might be telling a different story today because Mickey's character wasn't terribly interesting or individual. He was just a happy-go-lucky guy with an eye for a pretty girl, in this case, Minnie. That's why it's so interesting to see how Mickey developed year by year, film by film. As Walt tried to imbue him with a distinctive personality, Walt and his staff came to realize pretty early on that Mickey had great appeal, but he wasn't terribly funny. So they surrounded Mickey with a funny supporting cast, including Pluto, Clarabelle Cow, Horace Horsecollar, and the silly fellow who would come to be known as Goofy. And they kept the gags coming thick and fast. Walt placed great emphasis on the invention of gag ideas and offered bonuses to anyone on the staff who contributed good ones to the newest cartoon. But you'll see that even in a 1932 entry like The Whoopie Party, music still plays an enormous role. The film positively pulses with music, and a wonderful energy comes from that constant rhythm. Even inanimate objects come to life in order to sway to the music along with Mickey and Minnie. Some of these cartoons might be considered primitive by today's standards, but they're still a lot of fun to watch after all these years. By 1933, Walt Disney had one goal for his hugely popular Mickey Mouse cartoons, namely, make each one better than the last. He never stopped prodding his staff to think up new ideas and better gags, and the effort showed. Some of these black and white cartoons are surprisingly elaborate, such as The Mad Doctor, an ambitious spoof of the new vogue of horror movies in Hollywood, or Gulliver Mickey, which puts our hero into the world first imagined by Jonathan Swift. My favorite cartoon on this disc is Mickey's Gala Premiere. Although it doesn't take itself seriously for a moment, it does reflect the great success that Mickey was enjoying in 1933, when he was as big a movie star as any of the live actors who are caricatured in the film. If you're a movie buff, you'll have a great time spotting all the familiar faces, some of them instantly recognizable, like Charlie Chaplin or Laurel and Hardy, some requiring a bit more knowledge of the period, like Eddie Cantor or Marie Dressler. And since the premiere takes place at the world-famous Grauman's Chinese Theater, there's even a cameo appearance by its fabled owner, Sid Grauman. It was for this cartoon that Walt hired a talented Los Angeles newspaper caricaturist named Joe Grant, 
who had an illustrious career at Disney for years to follow and still contributes to Disney animation today. The last black and white cartoon on this disc gives a hint of what was to come in Mickey's career. Mickey's service station teams the plucky mouse with Donald Duck and Goofy with wonderful results. But it also underscored the fact that Donald and Goofy were broader, funnier characters than Mickey. After exhausting so many story ideas for their all-American hero, Walt and his team were happy to have other characters who could share the spotlight. But Walt was always loyal to his first star. After all, Walt didn't just provide Mickey's voice. That lovable mouse with the can-do spirit was Walt's alter ego. Hello, and welcome to Disc 2 of Mickey Mouse in Black and White, Volume 2. Fans, critics, and scholars have tried to analyze the success of Mickey Mouse from the very beginning of his career in 1928. It's hard to say why this simple character had such enormous impact and remains an icon of popular culture to this very day. It's often said that his optimistic attitude was just what the public needed as an antidote to the Great Depression. There's certainly some truth in that. But remember, Mickey's first cartoons preceded the famous Black Friday on Wall Street when the economy crashed. Walt and his colleagues often referred to Charlie Chaplin as a model for Mickey Mouse, not only in studying his exceptional pantomime and body language, but his characterization of the little tramp, the underdog of society that everyone could root for. Perhaps it's not coincidental that both Charlie and Mickey have stood the test of time. Look at a great cartoon like Mickey's Good Deed, and you'll also see how Walt and company drew inspiration from Chaplin's ability to blend comedy and heart-tugging emotion. This was a time when Walt was starting to think about the challenge of making a feature-length cartoon. He knew he couldn't do that unless his artist's skills improved, and until his gag men understood how to tell a more complex and carefully worked out story. Compare Mickey's Mechanical Man to one of the early talkie shorts, and you'll see how far they'd managed to come in a few short years. This is just what Walt envisioned, the constant refinement of animation as a storytelling medium. And it was always the mouse who led the way.